Hey folks, how's it going? It's been a while, but now it's finally time to take a good look at the evokers and pick one or two to work on. Before starting though, I'd like to make clear that this isn't a tier list, but a personal impression thing, and I'll be mostly looking for synergies with my teams and characters that I'm planning to get, assigning a priority to the evokers based on mostly pure personal preference. So, let's begin by looking at the required materials for one of the evokers and see how far along I've got just by farming randomly. Looks like the Sophia stones have been coming along nicely, I have enough for 3. The ideas have been getting randomly and it won't take long to finish farming enough just by focusing on one route and boss. The hazes are enough for 2 summons and I've got enough astras for 2 summons as well, as long as they're of different elements. Too bad I'm going to need 200 more to purchase the Pact Breaker. The event rooms are enough to fill a swimming pool and here comes the second roadblock. By skipping a bit too often, I didn't get enough special encounters, so I'm lacking on the root fragments part. Hopefully, it won't be too hard to fix. I also have little to no higher grand materials, but unless they're always hard to farm as the converging race, it shouldn't be too big of a deal. Now, let's move on to the characters. First in the list is Maria Teresa, a water draft linked to the Justice Summon. She's going to cover the role of a debuffer, damage booster and clutch healer and is going to work well together with other water characters who can dispel an enemy and help prep keep her on righteousness debuff. Her staff and soul specialties are both great for ultimate purposes, especially here in water with Europa, Altair, Drank and Folia. Her first passive allows her to inflict AoE water damage and a local debuff on righteousness for 3 turns every time an ally uses a dispelling skill, even if that skill has no effect. The debuff boosts the damage taken by the enemy while also lowering its attack. Her second passive works when she's in the backline and gives some extra punch to the frontline characters with dispels, granting them an AoE nuke and a 10% stackable attack and defense down. Her third passive takes effect when a frontline ally dies and she is swept in, granting an unlimited, undispellable 25% attack up and 20% echo buff to all water allies when attacking an enemy afflicted with the unrighteousness debuff. The Rogi also gets his damage boosted by 50% and damage cap boosted by 20% against foes with their local debuff on. Her first skill, Abraxas, deals 2 hit water damage and dispels, proccing her passive as well. The 5 turn cooldown on it also makes it so unretrocess only has a 2 turn downtime if no other characters with dispel are around. Her second skill allows her to set the HP and charge bar levels of the whole team up or down to the one of one member. This can be used as a powerful heal, a way to fill up everyone's charge bars, or a way to bring everyone down to red HP to enable her third skill. Fedelta is an AoE full heal and clear, also granting a 5 turn unique buff to critical, defense, multi attack rate, and damage cap, but it can only be used when all allies' health is on red. Some ways to enable this are going to be with Summer Zoe and Relocate to do it instantly, using Vayne in the front line and have it ready in about 4 turns or using Splitting Spirit multiple times on your main character, but that's going to take way longer. Of course, there's always the option of face tanking bosses until the health is depleted, possibly with a character that has a little attack dodged buff. The draconian cooldowns of 12 and 16 turns on her second and third skill though make her look like a character built for short fights, possibly starting in the backline, moving to the front when a boss kills a frontliner and attempting to end the fight in 5 turns from there. Her EMPs aren't anything to write home about either, having only two crit nodes and nothing else worth mentioning. Overall she looks like an okay character for high level content, Guild War 95 and 100 and possibly as a backup in Ultimate Bahamut level and in Lucidus raids since you need a ton of dispels there. Plus she's a blonde ref and as far as I know the only evoker who isn't a genocidal maniac, so that's another two good points in her favor and while this won't let her land the first place I think it's safe to say that she's going to end up at least in top 5. Moving on we've got Kaim, supposedly a human but really counting as all races, styles and weapon specialties thanks to his first passive. This means he's immune to Bahamut weapon races and able to benefit from all Ultima and Hollow Sky weapons. He looks like a mix of Lunalu and Lesia, copying skills and gaining stacks based on the color of the skill copied, but the effects are all pretty good and make him look like a very versatile character. Joining the crew after leveling up an attack summon also gives him extra points. Moving on with his passives, as a sub ally, the second one gives all earth allies a nice 20% attack boost and 10% damage cap boost, but all the weapons in the grid have got to be different. 
This is kind of a bummer after just being done grinding three Alexia Alexis and Katanas, but I guess it's not going to be a difficult requirement to reach. When switching to the front line, he gains 1 to 4 stacks of all his 4 seeds, resulting in quite a big self buff. His first skill, Double Deal, takes 3 turns to be ready to use and can only be used once, but it allows all Earth allies to cast their next skill twice. His second skill lets him copy an ally skill and goes on cooldown for 7 turns, changing to End of Joker, a 3 turn buff to a whole lot of stuff. Now for the weird part. His third skill, Blank Phase, changes into one of four poker seeds based on the color of the last skill an ally used. Attack skills, red, turn blank face into spade trick, allowing Kane to attack without using a turn and raising his spade stacks by one. The spade stack gives him a permanent attack buff and superior elemental damage based on the amount of stack he has, up to a maximum of four. Healing skills, green, turn it into heart trick, healing the whole team up to 2000 health and raising his heart stacks by 1. The heart stack boosts his healing specs and converts some of the incoming damage into health. Buffing skills, yellow, turn blank phase into the demon trick, which boosts all the charge bar by 15% and increase the demon stack by 1, granting him extra defense and turning all incoming elemental damage into water. Lastly, debuffs, blue, turn blank phase into club trick, which inflicts a delay, as well as a 10% stackable attack and defense down, while raising his club stacks by 1. The club stack gives him extra debuff success rate and an earth echo based on the stack level. Izoki resets the third skill back to blank phase, cutting down the 5 turns cooldown. He looks weird and fairly gimmicky, his end of joker buff only comes into account 7 plus turns into a fight or 7 plus turns after he gets swapped into the front line but he's got a nice delay, stackable attack and defense down, self echoes and can speed up the team Ogi nicely with the diamond trick. He's not exactly my cup of tea and Earth isn't my favorite element, but he looks like he could be a lot of fun to play with, at least in general content. I think he's going to make at least the top 5. Next up is Nier, the one who most needs a hug and some head pets. Her axe and dagger weapon specialties are really optimal, but she's a complete powerhouse, all focused on increasing damage while dealing some insane amounts of it herself. She has a little suicide countdown on her first passive, starting at 13 stacks and being reduced back to each turn, while also having her skills consume more stacks. There is no way to prevent her death, but you can work around it by bringing resurrection on your main character or fairies auto revive. Her second passive only works from the backline and grants the main character a little attack dodge if he gets hit from above 25% HP, basically Titan's Call. Her third passive gives all allies a special buff called Thirsting when she replaces a dead ally in the frontline. Thirsting gives all allies a not revive and partial damage absorption, allowing herself to stay in the fight for one more suicide cycle. Her first skill places a field that increases everyone's attack for 3 turns while also granting Dark Allies some bonus damage. Her second skill is a buff that grants a guaranteed triple attack and 50% increased defense for 4 turns to herself and an ally. It only has 1 turn downtime, but also costs her 2 Love's Redemption stacks. Her third skill, Last Love, is on a short 4 turn cooldown and grants Dark Ally a 1 time charge attack reactivation. This skill costs one stack of Love's Redemption as well. Her charge attack damage gets boosted based on how low the Love's Redemption stack is, up to 130% and a nice 65% charge attack damage cap. And speaking of charge attack damage cap, she has to cap up in her EMPs, which are going to have to be unlocked instantly. So that's 13 stacks on turn 1, down to 11 for Beloved, down to 10 for Last Love. Attacking brings her down to 8 stacks. Turn 2 ends with her at 6 stacks. Turn 3 and MC can properly Ogi now, with Nier at 80% charge attack damage and 40% charge attack damage cap up, ending the turn on 4 stacks. Turn 4 and her buff is not yet, an auto attack brings her down to 2. Turn 5 and she can only cast Last Love on an ally before saying goodbye. This is where Fairy's Auto Revive kicks in right on time. The 4 turn cooldown left on Fairy's third skill are even going to be enough to save Nier again once her stacks run out, but I've got to admit that's one hell of a high maintenance character. 
In enmity grids, she can help herself and another ally stay alive by decreasing the damage they take by 50%. Reduction that is even stronger in stamina grids, one fairy joins in. For hard content, you can either have a start in the backline or let her die in the frontline, revive her to join the backline, and then kill the fourth character in your lineup with that skull to activate her thirsting buff. She looks kind of insane, and I think she's going to do great in speeding up Guild War Nightmare 95s and 100s, as well as most general content you can take down in 5 to 10 turns. I'm also kind of tired of running Zoe in dark, and while that shouldn't really factor in for this decision, it still kind of does, and running near and fairy looks like a good way out of dark enmity. I'm afraid I'll be ranking her a bit higher than I should, but I think she's going to end up in my top 3. Thankfully, outside the top 3 though, we find the Stariola, a staff specialty Harvin whose gimmick is to switch between sleeping and awakened state. His sleeping state, or seclusion mode, prevents him from using skills manually, but each of his skills has an automatic activation effect that we'll see later, which also grants him one stack of Forbidden Chalices. When the Forbidden Chalices stack reaches 9, Estariola awakens, inflicting larger with damage and a local 2 turn restrained debuff, preventing the enemies from using normal and special attacks. His second passive allows him to buff all wind allies from the backline every time they get a chain burst. The buff range from attack up, double and triple attack up, echo, 20% charge burst boost and armored, which are all pretty good. Too bad it's random and it only lasts for one turn. His third passive takes effect when he replaces a dead ally and gives him the dreamscape buff, which allows him to activate his second passive at the end of every turn instead. Moving on to the skills, the first one is an Oinu can dispel that activates at the end of every turn. This could actually be very good for Lucilius. His second skill is a new Inuk, but this time it inflicts the local Restream debuff and activates every time an enemy uses a special attack. His third skill is yet another new Inuk, but this time it has a Liel attached to it, and only activates when he takes damage. Izogi grants all allies a one turn assassin buff and puts him back to sleep. He looks kind of weird, the only way he has to generate charge by when asleep is the 20% boost, or whatever other characters can give him. All his buffs only have one turn duration, and their random nature makes them unreliable. The Restrain debuff is probably his best selling point, especially if it works against endgame raids, but Wind has got plenty of good buffers and supports, so Estariola is going to fall to the lower priority spots for me. Next up is another rune, Throw. Her kit is thankfully a lot more straightforward and focused on skill damage with a little bit of support. Rogi inflicts damage and a local 3 turn duration red hit debuff, the same as the Devil's Call. Her first passive grants her a 2% boost to skill damage cap each turn up to 20%, as well as a 20% echo against enemies suffering from red heat. Her second passive allows fire allies to have their debuff duration extended by one turn when she's in the backline, which right now applies to Shiva's Purifying Flame, Grass Draco Force, Sam Reels as Accuracy Lord, Genda Goes as Solar Crown, Tsubasa as Petrified, and Halloween Dane was Sleep and Petrified. I'm sure more will be added eventually. Her third passive grants her a solid fortitude self buff when she replaces a dead ally in the frontline, allowing her to activate her skills twice indefinitely. Her first skill is a single target nook, which extends the debuff duration by one turn, stacking up to two turns if she has solid fortitude. Her second skill inflicts a 2 turn local charm like debuff called Nightmare Temptation. If her self buff is up, she adds Nightmare Scarlet to it, as well as a dispel. Nightmare Scarlet boosts the damage taken by the enemy by 10%. Her third skill is yet another single target nook, but it also grants through a stackable attack and defense up buffs, a 2000 team wide heal, as well as a clear. She looks like an alright character, nice and flexible, bringing quite a bit of utility to the team, she also looks like she can deal quite a bit of damage with her skill damage cap ups and multiple nooks. Another thing to consider is that she'll come home with a max up devil summon, and if I want to start looking into dark raptured hard mode, the 30% bonus HP might help out quite a lot. Also, she looks cute, and that's 3 extra points for her, putting her definitely in my top 5. Next up we've got Lobelia, another skill damage based character. His skills are linked, like the Levin trio, and they only have a one turn cooldown that they share, so you can only use them one at a time. 
His first skill is a 420k single target nuke that also grants him a 100% triple attack and a 50% echo for one turn, as well as a magic crest for his own stacking mechanic. His second skill is a 1.2 million away nuke, which costs 5 magic crests to cast and grants all allies a 3 turn skill cooldown cut. His third skill costs 10 magic crests to cast and grants all allies the Thunderbolt of Disaster buff, boosting all allies' attack and skill success rate and also adding a 420k nuke to all their skill casts. This buff's duration is indefinite and it can't be dispelled, but it doesn't work with zero cooldown skills. His charge attack just deals some bonus damage and passive-wise he deals some AoE earth damage every 3 turns thanks to his first one also gaining an extra magic crest. When he's in the sub slot, all earth allies gain a skill damage cap up whenever they cast a skill, and when he switches to the front line, he gets 10 magic crests so he can use his third skill immediately. While he looks like he can work well together with other characters who have their skills on short cooldowns and boost everyone's nukes, I don't really like this character. His first skill needs to be pressed almost every turn, and he doesn't bring anything else other than nukes. Hard pass. Gazenboger is up next, a mid in light. He looks like a good damage dealer with some tempting capabilities as well. His first passive slows down his charge by gain by 35%, but grants him a higher damage for normal attacks, and this effect increases based on the amount of Iron Fist stacks, going from 5% at 1 stack to 13% at 3 stacks. When he is in this Abala slot, he sets the maximum dark damage that light allies can take down to 10,000, and switching to the frontline grants him the Sparse Spangled Pummel buff. Another indefinite, indispellable buff that lets him quadruple attack and counter for 200% damage when he takes a hit under the divinity effect. He can gain a 3.5 turn divinity buff from his own charge attack. The buff is the same that the star summon gives, granting a 50% triple attack rate up, but increasing the damage that allies take. His first skill is a 17 hit light damage nuke to random foes that also grants him a stackable boost to hostility and raises his iron fist stack by 1. His second skill is an all ally substitute, able to cover up even for AoE attacks and a 3 hit counter on damage. His third skill grants him a 5 turn buff called Impregnable Fortress, granting him debuff immunity, jammed and little attack dodged. The 15 turn cooldown may look a bit too many at first, but the duration of this buff gets extended every time a light ally uses a healing or buffing skill that affects him, green or yellow borders, and you should bring many since he's going to get knocked out when the buff ends. In his EMPs, he has two crits and an enemy node, which are nice. I guess his first skill can be useful for Losisus' ninth labor, and between the Hollow Sky Axe and his quadruple attacks, he can dish out some decent damage. While not my first choice, I'm still interested in his kit, so I guess I'll put him in the mid tier for the moment. Moving on, we go back to Water with Haselia, a tiny water buffer. Her gimmick revolves around the lunar phases of her and her summon's Crescent Moon buff with her skills gaining increased effects based on the amount of turns left on it. She buffs all allies with the Crescent Moon upon using a charge attack, and this buff lasts for 4.5 turns, meaning it will have a 4 turn duration after she ogies, therefore starting with a 20% attack and defend buff and growing by 5% each turn. On the last turn, the buff stones into the full moon for a 35% attack and defense up. Her first and second skill are linked and share a 5 turn cooldown, with the first one applying a local stacking debuff to attack, defense, debuff resistance and accuracy, stackable up to 3 times, up to a maximum of 15%, as well as a delay, and the second skill buffing a single ally with unchallenged, veil, mirror image and a 3k HP shield. Kind of a weird protection skill, but I guess it makes using substitute a lot safer. Her third skill is also on a 5 turn cooldown and grants a 2 turn 20% water attack up, a special buff called Tier of Lunacy buffing double attack water bonus damage and damage cap based on the moon phase, as well as a 15% boost to charge bar. This skill also moves the Crescent Moon buff one phase forward, allowing for a nice 3 turns of full moon. As for the passes, Lunar Rainment boosts all water allies defense based on the moon phase, but on the backline she boosts 1% to all water allies attack and 2% to their defense based on the number of turns passed, capping at 20. When switching to the frontline, Haselia gets a unique, undispellable buff of indefinite duration that allows her to cast her skills twice. 
she will be able to cast her first or second skill twice or to cast both on the same turn as well as cast her third skill twice. Rush the moon phase up to full moon. Water Magna has always struggled damage wise for me and an almost permanent 20 to 35% attack buff doesn't look too bad. Her debuffs, while little, can prove useful and when Tora gets activated she can start buffing quite nicely. The only thing I'm not too fond of is the duration of those buffs. Her turns up time is a bit too little. Still, I feel like she has potential to help out in my water setups, so she's definitely in the top half of the characters that I like to get. Second to last we find Alanan, and before even reading his kit, he joins the top 5 priority for the simple fact that the sun is the most OP summon ever conceived, and after bringing it to at least 4 star, I might as well go the extra mile. Alanan comes in as a staff wielding buffer. His first skill deploys a field effect that boosts everyone's attack by 20% but lowering everyone's defense by 25%. The 8 turn duration is honestly enough for most raids, so the 12 turn cooldown isn't that much of a drawback. His second skill is Fairy's third skill. I've had Light Fairy for a long time and I've always had trouble setting that up and using it. I'm kind of waiting on Mechanic 2 to bring her back, so I expect to run into the same problems here with Elanan. His third skill deals a bit over a million damage to all foes and inflicts 4 local debuffs, a 500k damage over time, 25% attack down, 25% defense down and petrify, while also inflicting an 800 HP damage over time buff to all allies. I guess this one can be useful to get enmity running on next sax grid. His charge attack gains a 50% boost to damage and 20% boost to damage cap when used on the sun touch paradise field effect and that's at least twice on its first cast. Passive-wise, Benevolent Soul boosts all allies healing specs by 25% when the field effect is active, to try and make up for the defense down and damage over time I guess. When he's a sub-ally, he boosts healing specs of fire allies by 20%, while also granting an automatic clear when an ally takes turn-based damage. When switching to the front line, all fire allies gain Blessed Radiance, granting a 50% defense buff and absorbing 25% of the damage taken as HP up to a cap of 800. He looks fine for short fights, or fights where the bosses love filling up with debuffs since you can trigger his clear with the stuff of Prometheus, but the focus on damage over time and small heal doesn't help his case much. If it wasn't for the sun, he would join Estariola in the Forgotten Corner. Lastly, we have Katselia, Hacelia's brother, providing what looks like a very strong defensive option in Wind. His charge attack grants all allies a 20% earth damage lowered buff, as well as an earth switch for 3.5 turns. With a little charge burn gain, this can stay up indefinitely. His defensive kit goes on with his passive, making allies heal themselves by 10 HP for every 1% charge bar used. From the backline he grants a party-wide refresh for 350 HP for all allies with no debuffs and a 30% boost to wind attack for all allies suffering from a debuff. When he switches to the frontline he grants all wind allies the recurring anthem buff, boosting all healing specs and gaining 10% charge bar each turn. The play on the charge bar keeps going with his first skill, which is a toggleable buff boosting all allies defense by 100% as well as multi-attack rate but it eats up 30% of everyone else's charge bar each turn, triggering his passive for up to 300 HP heal each turn. His second skill gives all allies a 30% charge bar boost, a 30% boost to charge attack damage and a 15% boost to charge attack damage cap on a 7 turns cooldown. Honestly, not too bad, but it doesn't stack with Crisa or own buff. His third skill is yet another buff, this time granting a single ally a 1 turn 200% defense buff Little attack dodged and another substitute that also tanks AoE damage. Honestly, it doesn't look too bad, especially in off element fights like most current endgame ones. The first skill feels a bit too costly to maintain and only having a harp weapon specialty kind of hurts him, but I think you can work around his kit with some charge bar game buff and charge bar boosts, so while he probably won't make it in my top 5, he's definitely close. Alright then, it's time to rank them up. Starting with Maria Theresa, even though she's been held back by her long cooldowns, I still want to assign her a bit of a higher priority, so into high she goes. Kame can be gimmicky, but I might want to get him eventually, for now he'll sit in medium. Nier can be a perfect ticket away from Dark Enmity, she will definitely join the high interest tier. 
Estariola didn't give me a good impression and even if he did, he's losing point for being an old man, ending up in the low interest tier. Ro is plenty cute and I hope she's going to have some good potential for the future. I'd love to put her in high tier, but she's going to join Kami in medium. Lobelia... no. Gesenburger looks like a really solid character, but my light is kind of stuck already. Still, I wouldn't mind shooting for him eventually. Mid tier. Paselia looks good, but her buffs feel a bit too short. Maybe one day. Alanan, on the other hand, has the privilege of being blessed by the sun, but if I have to rank the characters based on preference, I would still place him in the low mid tier. As for Katzelia, his extremely defensive kit might come in handy eventually, but there's plenty of other options to survive in win, so he ends up in the low medium as well. Considering I'm about to spark for Europa and I already have enough characters to put on her side, I think I can wait a bit longer for Maria Theresa. Meanwhile, playing always the same team in dark has been getting boring, and Nier can be that breath of fresh air that I need. So she's going to move up a tier. In the mid tier instead, I'm kind of torn between Alanan and Fro, a dire dilemma between Meta and Waifu, but honestly, I'd rather leave the Sun Summon at 4 star and go for the Devil, so Fro is the one that jumps up a tier. And after a little bit of reordering, that's my last result. I believe I can work on two of them simultaneously, while Fro is going to have to wait a little, possibly after I 4 star the Sun as well. After them, Geisenburger and Kame are definitely the most interesting characters of the bunch, and even though it's going to take a hell of a long time, they're the ones I want to work on next. Well then, that's it for me for now. I hope you guys enjoyed this little selection process, and I'll see you around soon. Ciao!